and we're good. We're good to go. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> there was no count, so I was basically <laughs> working on some okay. things. Welcome to the Naoto's Nerdy Power Hour. My name's Naoto. For those of you who are watching, I, you may be familiar with me. Um, I am the well, head sharpener of the uh, knifeware here. Um, we have stores in Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, and Ottawa here, okay? Um, we Today's topic is kind of interesting, I guess, the uh, just ask any questions type of event. You know, for those of you uh, who like to learn about how to sharpen knives or kind of get into a little bit more depth about the uh, knife sharpening, just ask any questions. In the meantime, what I'm going to do is to sharpen this well very well used masakagi mizu guto 210 millimeters it just came in for the uh um mailing sharpening this is not the uh the best lighting to check the straightness but i'll try my best so if you have any questions just pop that in the comment section and i'll try to answer as much as i can there is a mason behind the camera, so who can just haul out the uh, questions? Hello. <laughs> so far, no questions, but uh, it seems that uh, somebody named Blank Blank might have some questions awesome. that might stump you. So awesome. as soon as Blank Blank's ready to hit us with something crazy. Oh, we here we do. Here we go. Uh, do you like Swedish carbon steel and why? It's from uh, Simone C. So Swedish carbon steel is something that the very general terminology of the uh, this carbon steel that is um, you know made in Sweden uh, or made from the uh, Swedish iron ore. Great thing about the Swedish iron ore uh, for the uh, longest term time is that it's actually really really pure. It didn't have much other impurities like a sulfurs or the uh, silicons to um, make the uh, steel a little bit more brittle. So um, it was really preferred, especially the uh, knife makers that we know, the uh, knife makers in Sanjo area. Um, when the father of Iwasaki, current Iwasaki uh, son, um, he was using the Swedish carbon steel for a lot of his uh, what you call at the uh, stray razors, all the you know razors, stray razors, and also the uh, his um, his not so much in pre prede predecessor, but um, the uh, well the Shigehusa who learned a lot from the uh, Yoshi Iwasaki san still prefers to use that uh, Swedish carbon steel. Because it's very pure, it's um, it's easy to work. It's easy to work with in terms of the sharpening. It's not necessarily the easiest to work with when it comes to the blacksmithing because of that the uh, you know temperature range and everything. It's a little bit more finicky. It's like narrower uh, temperature range um, for that, like heat treatment and stuff like that. But the uh, they do prefer that kind of steel because it's I guess. It reflects the um, the blacksmith the um, blacksmith skills and techniques a little bit more. It's it's like a mirror. It reflects very very well. Um, I have sharpened them. It's as a sharpener, it's really good steel to work with. Again, it is really responds very nicely. It doesn't have much other impurities, so it uh, cuts very nicely with the uh, synthetic or natural stones. And yeah, it, the, uh, it takes very, very nice edge with that. So, hope that answers that question. So, I'm just gonna keep doing what I've started it, which is to sharpen this mezu that came in for. So, the first thing I usually do is really to make sure that the knife is straight. Uh, Simone says, thank you for answering your question. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have another question. Mm -hmm. um, so this is from Blank Blank, who yeah. thinks they're going to 
stump you real good. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the two reasons steel manufacturers add silicone, silicon mm -hmm. to steel alloys? Um, apparently, they just learned a second reason a couple days ago, so it might be a little bit in the weeds. Huh. I the I always thought this is what I thought. Like I always thought the silicones are the um, what well, silica is the uh, one of the things that is the silicon or silica is the uh, one of the impurity considered to be impurities in the steel. But also, it's the silica is like. Um, it's a source of the uh, glass, right? So it's like tiny, tiny bit of uh, crystals that can be found steel. So if there is any good reason that the uh, that will be in the uh, in the steel, it's probably little crystals to get into the edge to you know bite into it and stuff like that. Maybe um, that's my kind of wild guess. Yeah. That's my wild guess. <laughs> what do you think, blank blank? Is yeah. that uh, is that legitimate? Um, blank blank also says that sulfur is more of a contaminant. Hmm. The difference impurities contaminants um, not quite. I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure the difference myself. The um, yeah, it, it is like the in Japanese translation we call it fujimbutsu, which means basically impurities in that ore. Um, but the there's another question. I don't think it's meant to stump you. Uh -huh. It's more just a general question. Uh -huh. Have you ever been to the uh, Nankai Ketsura Onsen in Wakayama? Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah, that the uh, I have uh, I'm I'm from Wakayama and uh, yeah, it's kind of far from where I actually live. It's in the same prefecture, but it's like me going to uh, like from Calgary and going to Grand Prairie type of feel. It's only three hours, so it's like Calgary Edmonton, but in Japan it feels almost like you know for takes forever type of you know thing, right? So it's like me going to Grand Prairie for onsen, yes. But I have the uh, it's beautiful the. Uh, they have this uh, giant hotel uh, called Urashima, which uh, all the pa all the uh, guests will take a small boat to actually go to this island. It's actually a peninsula, <laughs> but you have to take the boat to actually get to the hotel. Uh, lots of different nonsense, and it's it's very very fun. It's really almost like an amusement park. Plus, you get to stay and you get to eat. You know, decent stuff. Yes. So yeah, if you ever go, like, try that. It's kind of fun. I like Shirahama Onsen because it's a little bit closer to me. It's in about an hour, hour, hour and a half drive from our place. Shirahama Onsen has a very, very long history. It's considered to be one of the uh, three oldest um, hot springs in Japan. Cool. And for those of you, if you want to get the really nice smooth skin, go to Ryuji Nonsen, that is considered to be one of three. Um, the We call it Bijin no Yu. Bijin means the uh, um, good looking lady. Uh, so, um, you know, if you want to be, uh, you know, those get that little bit more silky smooth skin. Oh, so it's like a the, spa sort of situation. It's just really different, the uh, different, type of the uh like some are alkaline some are more acidic and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff and uh, generally speaking alkaline water is it's not too high but alkaline water is uh this um what you call it the consider it to be a good for your skin and kind of smooth it out nice uh we have another non-knife question from corbin black mm -hmm. uh my soon-to-be wife and i are heading to tokyo this christmas oh nice uh, he's planning to visit Fujiwara's place. Are are there any other Smith experiences nearby Tokyo? Nearby Tokyo, it may be a little hard. Um, the Fujiwara-san's place is definitely good. And I believe he may, I don't know if he does still, if he's doing uh, in the future, but he was and he did do a little bit of a blacksmithing experience. Not so much in near Tokyo, but if you want to like really do good 
uh, sniffing experience. There are a few places. I mean, Takebunai Village is kind of a little away from Tokyo. It's like takes two, three trains to get there. Uh, there's a good spot in the uh, in Gifu Prefecture. Uh, get off at the, the station called the uh, Hayama uh, Hashiba. Yeah, the it's right before the Nagoya, I think. And there is a uh, blacksmith, um, Asano Kajia, who is the swordsmith. And we don't carry his, you know, knives. You know, he's not necessarily a uh, um, knife kitchen knife maker, but he seems to have offered lots of good classes. Hands-on classes with the uh, um, with people, you know, you get to actually hammer steels. Um, but because of the um, you know COVID restrictions and everything, lots of places, um, I don't think they are accepting any. But that's something to uh, consider for sure. I'm, I mean, at least you get to kind of see how he does things, right? How's that uh, Mizu turning out for you? It's pretty good. It's been uh, sharpened a few times, and I think I sharpened this. Uh, but uh, the one of the reason, um, some one of the reason why I sharpen the way I do is that to make like next or like, make basically sharpening easier for years to come, basically, right? So. I don't have to struggle to get the spot that I that I want. We have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty interesting, actually. Uh, is it possible to restore a Karochi finish? I'm thinking about etching an acid. Do I need to remove the old Karochi completely to avoid color difference? The Karochi, it's very difficult to bring it back when it and what I meant is to get original color because how the color comes is after uh, from the heat treatment so you basically uh, heat treatment of uh, heating up the steel to something like algami is like 800 780 degrees to 850 degrees or something like that and uh, cool it down with oil water or for shirogami with oil but you know it, it's a burned steel right so it's really hard to restore but here's a little bit of a thing about to get in this different similar color is it's pretty popular way of doing it it's called bluing in north america or probably in japan too it's uh Jap japan we call it kurozome it's more of dying it's the uh putting the color on the knife instead of the so bluing um, you get that you can actually get a, this the little powder chemical compound of bluing gum metal gum metal powder or something like that those those guns they're black right they're dyed so it's not like from the crochet it's, it's actually been dyed so there are actually chemicals that have been sold and some actually knife makers sharpeners do use these to restore that the look of the crochet um, but because of its dyeing process, it will look a little bit different. The color will look a little bit different. So if you want to get the really nice consistent finish, you, you may want to use just um, like a little bit of abrasive, um, what you might call it, the uh, rusty eraser or something to remove the uh, whole black finish first, then use those. Uh, Alan says, thanks. Yeah. I think you answered his question. Um, we're going to go back to Japan with the next question. Ah. Uh, what do you think are the best dishes? Uh, uh, very, very good. Best dishes from Japan that haven't gained traction in North America. Oh, that's that's good answer. That, good, good it is question. a good question. I'm good curious question. what you have. There. And I mean, like, you know, Mason, you have some insights as well, for sure. Because the you, you, you used to live in Japan for a little while, right? Sure. But I... A lot of the things that I tried that um, aren't popular here might be like it might. I think North Americans might be a little bit squeamish mm. to try mm -hmm. uh, things like cod sperm mm. or yeah. uh, right, right. or like the little white fish. Right. The, yeah. The uh, shirawo. I can't remember the white the white. Yeah. Yeah. White. Whether it comes like a pile on noodles. 
I forget. I was at a little town. Yeah, and yeah, they, yeah. Had, they served like a, a, a don with. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Not of, noodles. Or not noodles. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, um, yeah those, those ones are really good. Yeah, I guess like a lot of people have, I know, fear of eating the uh, like fish with eyes. <laughs> yeah. Part. So like, you know, eating the pile. That's like actually the sardine um, babies. Right, it's been kind of uh, so. Sh um, that's the uh, shi what's that? shirasu. It's famous for a lot of places like in the uh, Yokohama, no, not Yokohama, but the Kamakura area, and where I'm from, actually Shirahama, that's pretty uh, famous as well. What? Hi. Japan is very interesting because of how it came to be before the Meiji Restoration. Uh, you know, each regions were ruled by the different warlords and sometimes they especially the remote areas far from the tokyo or the uh at the time it's called edo the uh farther you go from edo the culture the the culture what they eat what they even speak uh was so much different from the uh, what the people in tokyo uh was consuming eating and you know like speaking um like, and that was like a strategical uh, reason as well. The uh, they, um, Tokugawa, the uh, shogunate, uh, successfully placed those rulers who were against the uh, Tokugawa to that the farther apart, so that they can they have to go through all other allies to get into Edo. Anyways, um, but because of that. Cultural diversity in one city or one village to another is huge. It's you move like say you go from one place to another, you will encounter something that's like so special. It's only available in that city uh, type of situation, right? The um, and the, there's a there's a deep sense of pride whenever somebody's showing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that dish or exactly whatever. right. Yeah. So. Um, like I can tell what I like, <laughs> right? The uh, something like um, some dish that and that may do well in. I mean, kushikatsu is still not really a thing yet. Uh, basically, it's a skewered deep fried. Um, it's like tonkatsu, mm. but the, it's in the skewers and it's like bite size. Um, I think that will do very very well, especially in the Osaka area. Uh, there are a lot of uh, kushikatsu restaurant. I mean, zakushi maybe do that in uh, Vancouver, but I'm not sure. sure. But the, it's basically deep fried with in a skewer. It's like people like that lollipop. You know, people like lollipop um, <laughs> ice cream, um, deep fried ice cream on the stuff, right? And so that kind of stuff. But the um, when uh, in Osaka, basically you have the this container um, filled with sauce, and you dunk in and eat it. But you don't dunk twice because mm. you know it's 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 not sanitary. So don't don't do it twice. But <laughs> that that would definitely do really well. You know who doesn't like deep fried? And it comes in lots of different forms. Like not only meat, they do you know asparagus. Okay. Um, quail egg. Uh, lots lots of different veggies too, right? So I just remembered a dish that I really loved that isn't really served here is uh, deep fried. Um, the khaki fry, deep fried oyster. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I love it. It's so good. Yeah. I mean, that, that can be on the skewers and served there too, right? Yeah. We, yeah. we have a few uh, knife and steel questions now. Uh -huh. So let me uh, go back and see how far back we go here. Okay. Um, Spoon Monkey 3 asks, yes. can I ask that you detail how to properly thin a convex bevel? Uh, finger positioning, pressure, etc., that sort of thing. So what I usually do for the convex uh, thinning is to uh, work on a few different spots. It's, it's really common, right? What I start is to start from the very edge here and pressure, and I even raise the angle tiny bit even if you want to actually give that a little bit more convexity here. Right then, I will follow my those two index fingers on right or pressuring fingers because I, I changed my hand. Uh, pressuring fingers closer to the bevel, right? Then you sharpen that. So now you have two different angles. 
closes the edge, then the uh, bevel, right? Then I will kind of focus on the kind of middle part the, that kind of connects the, those two angles together, right? So it's it kind of has the three different um, angles now. And it's really difficult to keep the uh, exact angle for all, all the way. So that three angle will start to connect each other, making a little nicer convex, if that makes sense. I do it three. I Especially the uh, knives like this that has a very shallow bevel, you can't really do like four or five because the pressuring points, and I mean fingers, like how how skinny, how much pressure you are applying in one spot, it doesn't really change that much. So I usually do it three um, kind of as as you go, it kind of try to connect all three dots. Smooths itself out yeah. in the mix. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. At least I think I get it. Uh, another question is, in your opinion, which makers are making the finest honyaki in Japan? I can't really talk too much about honyaki knives because the uh, um, I've seen quite a few. I have, but I have not owned one, and I've only sharpened very few. So I can talk from, I guess, what I've heard, what I've talked to those people, uh, um, and and also what I've you know kind of known, right? The uh, the current modern uh, Sakai way of uh, honyaki knives, the technique's been established by the uh, Okishiba uh, Masakuni-san, and that, the skill was passed it down to the uh, Genkai Masakuni in the, uh, in the Kyushu island. He used to be in the Sakai area that moved to the, uh, the, the small island in Kyushu. And he is considered to be the best um maker for honyakis um so that's he's said to be i've never seen his uh, work uh sure it's great um but they can't really talk too much about that what i know though the um the young blacksmiths like in, i mean like i actually went to uh, see there are only a very few blacksmiths in sakai who um I you mean like you know Sakai? There are actually very only a very few blacksmiths left now, so it's kind of hard um, because the um, but there are three blacksmiths who lives in Sakai who forges um, honyaki knives: Yoshikazu Ikeda san, Togashi Kenji san, Kenji Togashi san, and Satoshi Nakagawa san. Uh, Nakagawa san is the youngest of uh, all three. He learned all the skills from the um, his uh, master, I guess the uh, he took it over his master's workshop. He learned all, and I'm trying to remember as I'm <laughs> saying his name. But the uh, Ken Shiraki san, uh, Ken Shiraki san retired, and <clears throat> Nakagawa san took it over. Um, and Nakagawa san actually makes fantastic konyaki blades. And his lots of hard thing about konyaki blades is that the uh, such a high uh, failure rate. And also it's hard to stretch because it's just one piece of steel. One piece hard steel, it doesn't have a softer steel on the outside. So um, that's really all that, all that. And heat treatment and try to make a different hardness on uh, one part of knife to another. It will, there's more um, rate of failure. Um, and then that's one of the reasons why that the uh, those knives are super expensive. Um, great thing about the uh, Nakagawa-san is that um, his rate of failure is impressive one in 20. Um, a lot of people do fail a lot lot more but also the uh, he does um, he does tr he is true to the tradition as well for the shirogami and aogami he just do it the white uh, water quenching rather than the uh, oil quenching for the honyaki so um, yeah it's 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 fantastic so I I think he he it will be if not, he is right now. He will be the uh, best uh, honyaki maker. Uh, if not right now, he will be very, very soon. Um, he's actually trying a lot of different uh, hamon, which is the little line. Um, the one that he actually, actually, this is kind of funny because the, uh, the one of the, the Sakai Kikumori's um, um, 
vice president of Kikumori was visiting us uh, yesterday and he was showing us uh, some um, very unique pattern of uh, hamon that uh, Nakagawa-san was making. It's, it almost it almost looked like um, the sword hamon. It's got really choji hamon. It's, it's a little bit midare choji. It's like, I mean, like you can't really tell, talk about the uh, sword hamons because there are so many different schools. There's even, but it's it's like it's it's very random. It's no, it was beautiful, um, and hopefully we're gonna get them very soon. Uh, we have a few more questions here. Yeah. Uh, blank blank is going into the chemistry again. Mm -hmm. uh, why do steel manufacturers use powder metallurgy processes when making more complicated alloys of steel? Why? Yeah, why? The um, powder metallurgy is not really developed for the kitchen knife making. Kitchen knife steels are most mostly byproduct of the regular steel makers. Like high speed powder, uh, high speed steels are designed to uh, for the high speed tools, right? I mean, if you have the uh, uh, drills to you know drill drill into holes and stuff. And I'm sure you have done a few times. I've done a few times. Like when you drill into it, took a little bit longer and take it out. And the drill is so hot, right? Because the friction, right? And the friction is not like heat is not great. The it really depends on what type of heat tolerance that the those steel has. But the some of the steels don't like say these guys, the Aogami, the heat tolerance uh, is like very low, right? Like if he hits the 180 degrees. Um, uh, centigrade, it it started to kind of soften, and you don't want that from the heavy industrial tools, right? So the high speed steels are created to prevent that from happening. And high, sp the powder metallurgy is really to get the um, powder metallurgy is great because it's um before you have to mix everything in in a melted form and paddle them paddle them mm -hmm. to kind of mix them together where the powder metallurgy you can mix them in a powder form and a little bit more evener uh distribution of each different the uh, elements and you could now add a little bit more um elements than the regular melting uh format than the reg um because it it kind of consolidates it but like by pressure and heat mm -hmm. where um, melting, it's like uh, how I understand is like you can melt so much salt into water. There's the uh, there's a saturation point, mm -hmm. and after that, the uh, all the salt is just gonna stay in the water, right? So uh, I think that's that's how they came came up with the uh, the, the powder metallurgy. Uh, Corbin Black has been mentioning a lot of Japanese foods that uh, he thinks are underrepresented in mm -hmm. in um, Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, but he also mentions that they had a kushikatsu spot in Montreal oh, nice. who, unfortunately, the chef has died of COVID, oh. uh, which was really sad, but they would spend like $250 every time they went there. So oh, it sounds right. great. Yeah. Um, oh, one oh. more thing. The uh, not underrepresented, but the uh, good soba is something we're missing. Good mm, soba place. I agree. I love a I love a um, tempura soba. Yeah, uh, like a veggie tempura. Because everyone uses yeah, Everyone uses these uh, frozen soba at any like generic Japanese restaurant. They say zero soba. Basically, what they serve is it's one of those frozen Nishin frozen soba noodles. They put it in the <laughs> hot water and just. So they're, you're saying no one makes their own soba? Not in like, not really where I uh, yeah. like here. There used to be a place in Calgary called Sobaten, and mm -hmm. they, they were making it, but it, it wasn't really successful. It was too, I think, early for yeah. Calgary to have the soba specialized restaurant 20 years ago. Yeah. Right. Okay, back to steel. <clears throat> What's the optimum balance? between sharpness and durability for average knives between uh, 58 and 63 HRC. Well, so, yeah. uh, and is it worth it to get a knife to 100 BESS, which I'm not familiar with, so I hope you are. 
B E S S. Hmm. Dave, we might need a explanation of that yeah, before we can move forward on that question. But really, the uh, the balance is really up to like you, right? The um, I for my perspective or for me to use uh, my kind of the because like as I as I kind of said like in last um, stream. Um, I mentioned that you know there there's a like little balance that you have to find in the triangle that the uh, harness um, the durability no the uh, harness ductility, ductility and the uh, rust resistance mm. the uh, not the wear resistance but so the you have to kind of find the fine balance some people are fine with you know not to worry about the uh, stain resistance or that, uh, you know, prone to rusting, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can go like. Yeah. And then just those. take care of your knives. Yeah. Otherwise uh, we got an explanation here. It's the Brubacher edge sharpness scale. Um, oh. Daddy dating advice says uh, factory knives are about 150. And um, oh, it's, it's one of those, the um, it's one of those things to uh, the wire that cuts the, okay. uh, I think, I think that that's, what it is, if that's if that's we don't we don't use we don't, we don't use the uh, yeah. those items the uh, so can't really can't really speak, speak on to, on yeah, the speak actual on, uh, numbers, but it's really there are a lot of sharpness testing, and I think all of them are legit and all of them are not legit. Um, the other pluses and minuses. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's 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 legit for certain reasons, and there are. Um, you know, not so much practical for a lot of reasons as well. So um, I can't really speak because if that that edge, like the testing, really basically what what it is is that they have that little piece of wire, and they you put the knife on and try to cut it, and there's I think scale on the bottom mm -hmm. that you know tells you how much pressure. pressure that needed to cut cut the a piece of string, right? Mm. So, uh, you know, bigger the number is, it took a little bit longer. You have yeah. to push a little bit more. Um, anyways, that is, you're only talking about very last edge fineness. Um, but knife, knife here is not all right here. Mm. It's this here, this here this here so you're only talking about the like exactly tenth of a millimeter yeah exactly yeah um and that test will tell you and i can't never used it myself before so i can't really speak to speak of that machinery but the uh I'm not quite sure if that rougher the edges it cuts faster or the smoother the edge is, is cuts faster, mm -hmm. or it that may not change that much because, or if the angle of sharpening, say, if you sharpen it this way, that way, if you see the microscopic level, it edges are either go this or mm -hmm. this, right? So I can't really speak to that, but I can tell you again, is the, uh, the good balance between the hardness durability and the, I guess, the rust resistance is like, it really, uh, my good, like my go-to knife here that I can uh, do a lot of things with is at the uh, Rockwell of 58. It's got a really good ductility. It is made with the uh, uh, Wood the Home um, AEB-L steel. Um, also known as very similar to 13C26, I believe. Uh, so it's a little bit um, ductile. Uh, it's really good. Um, and it takes very good, decent hardness. It's not It's not the um, most hard steel. So it may need a little bit more maintenance. But I do like it because that particular knife, again, I'm not just talking about the uh, steel type that particular knife is very, very, very thin. Mm -hmm. So when I'm cutting into, say, I use that 270 Gyuto for cutting into the kabocha squash. 
uh, sort of related to this, mm. uh, Dave Smith asks if competition sharpness is worth it when discussing your garden variety kitchen knife. No. Okay. No, the, um, it, it has to, so competition, if there's the, this competition, that'd be very fun. Is that it's not just the numbers, the, um, but the, um, you know, you, you get a variety of judges and sharpen and, and decide which dish to create, what ingredients to cut. Same thing, same <laughs> ingredients, same chef, but use different knife sharp, knife that's sharpened by different sharpeners that has this, you know, crazy imagination around not only that cuts the best, but how it affects the flavor of food. It's subtle, but there is differently. Because basically, you know, like the uh, how how it breaks cells, how it release the uh, all the flavors from that the food and stuff, that's slightly different, right? Think about it. The um, if you want to get the maximum flavor out, like say making a stock bone stock. You break them. You basically, like I, when I make my uh, python stock at home, I use that the, this hand blender late after and just do this, right? So that all the, the flavor is out. But sometimes, say it's good sushi, if you have the intention to preserve the flavor until you bite into it, so your teeth is breaking all the flavors out. You want to use as smooth of the edge to cut the fish so that when it hits the tongue, you'll be like, okay. And you bite into it, it just explodes. So if there is some any competition like that, I'd be very interested, but it's very subjective. Uh, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> of course. Uh, we're going to change direction yet again. We're yeah. throwing you all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, blank Blank asks, how does burning on a knife handle work? And what is the process? Just an answer I think maybe could be interesting for people oh. maybe. Like just how yeah, yeah, you get yeah, a yeah, yeah. handle on. The, um, I don't have, I have to go get it. But basically the um, Japanese knife handles, like traditional handles like these ones, um, are called burnt in into the, uh, the, the blade. What it is, is that um, there are a few things that actually, I, I found it is so amazing um, because the, um, so I was at the this uh, Tatsumi-san's workshop who makes tons of tons of handles for the uh, Sakai knives, right? It's such manual labor, it's, everything is in like, all the machineries are so manually operated. Basically, they just spin something, mm -hmm. and you have to do a lot of stuff by hand. Um, but the um, when they pl um, put the holes in, they do one hole in the middle that's drilled in, right? But after that, they actually use the uh, piece of piece of basically like a knife, piece of knife tang like this, heat it up and burn them. It's almost like a casting a shape mm -hmm. into it, burn them. Um, so that it can be, um, because each knives are different, like in the thickness and stuff, they make that the guide hole like that first, then the each knife makers or the wholesalers, they also heat up the tang and just, put that in to custom fit it. Um, few good things. Um, by burning them in, you have to heat the uh, tang real good. Otherwise, the uh, you're just like pr prying them and it may crack the, uh, crack the wood, right? It is not applying the pressure outward. You're actually burning them in so that it uh, heat fits in very nicely. 
um, used to be, it was great. By burning them, it actually holds that uh, handle in place. It's burned, oh, inside is burned as well. And so not, not many actually knife maker before were using any uh, adhesives to actually hold up the uh, knife in place. Another thing that was fascinating is that how those handles are made. Traditionally, they are uh, made with the, I don't have that traditional way, but the, uh, this, this collar part here, they have the wood and the collar. Uh, this part is traditionally all water buffalo horn. And what they, how they do is they boil water buffalo, it's already been cut like round. And they boil water buffalo horn and they, because it's round and these are oval, mm -hmm. they squeeze like this, fit it and release so that it fits in very nice. There's no, um, no actually uh, adhesives here for the traditional water buffalo horn. Um, then they grind them to smooth it out. But great thing about that is the uh, water buffalo horn, event, uh, over time it will actually uh, uh, dry them a little bit and tightens it. So that mm -hmm. also uh, keeps that the knife in place. So there are a lot of different mechanisms actually in that piece of um, handle. handle. The, so that, that's, that's, that's why. And also if it needs to, especially in Japan, the, uh, the climate there is much more humid. Mm -hmm. So if this needs to be replaced, a clean, clean up, you can knock it off fairly easily and put it back on. Cool. Um, I got a question about hot rodding. Uh -huh. <clears throat> uh, Barbacoa Brothers says, I have an old Hitori Santoku HD series yeah, yeah, yeah. that I've sharpened down to the Damascus cladding and will be my first thinning adventure. Uh -huh. any, any pointers? So again, the uh, that kind of stuff is a little bit more hard because the uh, it doesn't have a guiding bevel, right? The it's, It is a Damascus uh, DG10 steel. So um, what I would do is, like I said, for the convex uh, sharpening, I would put my your fingers pretty close to the edge, give a little bit of an angle, about like, I don't know, two, five, five degrees, something, and sharpen them until you, um, you make it thin enough, also you expose the core steel enough. Then, Unlike these knives that has the primary bevel like this, Shinogi line and the bevel like this, unlike those steels, uh, those knives, th the Hattori knives are just one very gradual convex. So um, what you want to do is the instead of follow, do two, um, I said two, three sections like this, edge, bevel, and middle. I would do very close to the edge, Lower it down, lower it down, lower it down. Kind of three, four different angles to get that nice um, convex back. Cool. But that, that'll be a lot of work. So, yeah. Just be reminded. Just just be careful. You will be grinding your finger off by <laughs> doing this. Uh, okay. Okay. Um... This is an interesting question from DHOP310. Mm -hmm. I recently picked up a Shigafusa Kitaji, Kitaji yeah. uh, 180 millimeter petty. Yeah. Should I use it or preserve it as a collector's item? Uh, it's up to you. I mean, like these <laughs> knives are designed to be made, designed to be used. The uh, I, in that particular, like I can speak of that particular region or the school of thought, I guess, right? The uh, They're making tools. They're making tools for the use. So, um, so why why would it be preserved as a like? What what are the reasons for keeping it as it's a such a rare piece? Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. You, you you don't get it. I, we only come around one or two a year. Mm. Like so, um, yeah. Like that's really totally up to you. The um, one of the one of the primary reason, not so much in you know, a petty double bevel ones. But the, one of the primary reasons for the Shigefusa to use the Kitaeji, the Damascus, hand, actually the you know, ho homemade Damascus steel, is to prevent that steel 
or the knife from warping. Um, so if it's a Yanagiba and Deba, I would definitely like to use them and see how they react, how they kind of, and also the way that they made it, they made it so that's easier to sharpen as well. So um, if I were lucky enough to have the, the, one of the Shigehusa knives around, come around, I will definitely, I will use them very occasionally, but the, I will definitely gonna use it. And I would love to sharpen them, just really see, to see what kind of, you know, thought process, the philosophy have gone into that, the creation of that knife. Thanks. <clears throat> um, now, Philip Ortman asks, what about the balance of edge retention and longevity Longevity, yeah. sorry, <clears throat> of a knife. Realistically, what would be the lifespan of a knife made by made with uh, W two mm -hmm. uh, compared to Algami Super if you or just for like, stainless fan silver three to R two or so? Say, you know what though? Like realistically speaking, I mean, like if you have only one knife, um, home use probably gonna last you your lifetime. I have been working for knife for like 10 plus years. Uh, I've collected, you know, a few knives over, over a period of time, but I do, I did grab one knife from knife before I started working here. And that knife, uh, it's been around about 15 years, seen uh, sharp, like 20 times, sharpened 20 times or so. It's been used for, uh, I brought it to Japan to uh, practice sharpening on the knife and stuff. Still has a lot of um, steel left. It's Santoku. It came from, it, it was about the 50 millimeter. Um, so like two inches tall and it's still good. And it, I'm, those knives have the uh, core steel for all the way through the spine. So I'm, it may become very small pity. If you're professionals, and especially Japanese professionals who's trained to sharpen the knife every day, which I, I think it's an overkill, but you know, it is, you know, it is what it is, right? Uh, those knives uh, last uh, about 20, 15 to 20 years, like say from Yanagi, mm -hmm. to become very small petty. Mm -hmm. And so it's, home use i i and it really shouldn't matter if it's shogami bg10 um yeah it's just really how it prolongs it in between sharpening like you know one may requires sharpening every you know six months some mm -hmm. needs every eight months you know mm -hmm. that kind of stuff so <clears throat> uh E30 Birdie, that's a fun name to say. Uh, what's your take on Kobayashi versus Shibata Kotetsu Bunka? Mm. I think I want to replace my Kyohei. Oh, <laughs> so the both very thin, the um, very well made. Um, Shibata san actually, um, Shibata san actually kind of introduced uh, Kobayashi san to us. Mm -hmm. The uh, he because the when Shibata san looked at Kobayashi san's blade, he was like, It's very similar to what I do. <laughs> so, how thin those blades are, it's uh, it's very similar. The um, I personally like Shibata san's kotetsu, although it's a little bit harder to come by these days, um, because the he not only puts the uh, thickness and the last bevel edge a thought, but also the uh, he purposely leaves that the side a little bit more rougher. That breaks a little bit more tension between the food. Um, also, it re could release a little bit more umami like for some, some food. So um, I love how he does and Kobayashi's blades, it is handmade. There are a lot of hand involved, like, you know, using the wheels, but he does in a certain um, processes, put in the machine, the, the bit of automation grind, where Shibata-san doesn't do any. So it's a little bit more 
hands-on in that kind of sense. So I like the uh, Shibata-san's Kotetsu line a little bit better over a uh, Kobayashi-san, but both cuts beautifully. Both cuts beautifully. Both are super, super um, thin. Another um, factor uh, is that the uh, Shibata-san's Kotetsu always, always have this really nice round uh, space for the knife, my finger to fit. So that, that's really the... Also, another thing. Hmm. Um, there's some talk about how uh, Vic, uh, Victoria Knox, et cetera, those kind of knives often get sharpened right away in a couple of years, but mm -hmm. those really aren't the knives that we were discussing mm -hmm. uh, when we were talking about how long a knife would last. Um, and also, E30 Birdie is, uh, just mentions that Shibata seems to be out of stock everywhere. Right I know. Now, so. it's, it's super hard to come by. The... Um... I know what. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's all the questions we have for awesome. now. Oh, here we go. Um, blank blank is curious about how the uh, Hammond line is formed on Oya on Yaki. How? Yeah. How? I think the so here's like I've spoken to like a lot of uh, different um, people, right? The uh, how it's formed is the. Um, Basically, it's difference in the hardness, right? So what happens is the, it's like, um, so if you looked some knives made by the uh, Ikeda-san, and some knife makers done this, they made any line above Hamon to very white, misty finish and leaves all other parts mirror. That tells me Though, softer steel um, or scratch a little bit easier. Like a Kasumi Misty finish, right? Mm -hmm. So what they do, well, how to, first, how to get just a hammer like that? They use different stuff, but oftentimes they use the, um, the Shisan Katetsu in Japanese and the, the little acid oh, that yeah. one's the thing that we use for acid etching sure they just like lightly touches where the hamon is and that uh, brings that uh, little line up right mm. um but the real thing is that the uh because it has a difference on the hardness when they sandblast them the hard steel part won't get scratched i mean you have to choose the right material to sandblast yeah, right it, it resists it better exactly so the uh, when you do that, it the uh, the hard steel part won't get scratched up, where the softer part get a little fogged up, mm -hmm. right? So it's basic, um, you know, hardness difference, right? Well, I have a question then. Mm -hmm. So if they didn't do any of the acid or the sandblasting, would you be able to see that line? Very faintly, yes. The okay. uh, you could, but. Um, It'd be more of a color rather Very than Very subtly, yeah. yes, you can, yeah. Uh, and then E30 Birdie just mentions that, uh, I'm, I think this is from, I'm not sure what it, what's a Tetsujin Metal Flow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They ordered one in December and they're waiting for it. Right. <laughs> the Metal Flow, yes, it's beautiful. The Metal Flow is the, uh, this, all knives, steels have the uh, flow. Oh, is it the, like the? The line. It's not Damascus, but it is, it's like, it's hard to explain, but it, when like it's like grain? metal, yeah, it's like a grain. When it's metal stretched, the, um, it kind of gives you a little flow line there. Some knife makers like uh, Tetsujin decided to showcase that uh, metal flow. Mm, nice. New lines of Masashi oh. unintentionally. I've seen few with the flow line. It's and funny it's, you should mention Masashi because Blank Blank is asking if, uh, has he spoken anymore about the SLD or SKD? Uh, I can't remember the, the magic steel he was working on. Yeah, the, I mean, the, um, so he's like, you know, he's been working with the, uh, the VS1, which is the SKD 11 equivalent, the uh, 11, no, 12 
the semi stainless steel, those two numbers are very so similar. Uh, VS1 and the SLD um, steel. He doesn't actually done much work with SLD Magic yet. SLD Magic is like kind of um, better version of SLD, but um, he kind he does the little bit of, like he's kind of guy who follows the sheet. Like for the heat treatment, and this is like what this is what it says. Like this is what temperature it should be um, quenched at. This is the, the temperature that should be um, tempered at. And but he, from his experience, he used that as the guide. But from his experience, he knows that those numbers are from the lab that's been tested on the one centimeter cubic um, piece of metal. Not the knife, not they don't look anything like a knife, right? Mm -hmm. Right? They, they, you know, it's a test piece. Mm -hmm. So they heat treat them and test the hardness and do that. So how we try, like how it travels heat like this form to the cube is quite a bit different. Mm -hmm. And from that experience, he and also testing, he sends that knife, finished knife, to the lab. And the, at the lab, they cut the knife in various sections and test the hardness. Because a lot of knives are made with the clad steel. And a lot of, as some of you may know, Rockwell hardness testing is the surface hardness. So only gets to test the edge part. So what they do is they have to cut and the Rockwell is actually pretty big needle actually sticking into the uh, steel. Mm -hmm. So you can't really do the uh, proper Rockwell test on a knife like this. Mm -hmm. So what they do instead is they cut and check the, the tiny section by Vickers testing. And they convert the number into the uh, Rockwell testing. Oh, okay. Anyways, what they found, what he ha found is that the way that he quench and some tempering um, he will be able to make the steel perform or the uh, reach to the little bit better hardness than the the paper sets it's his secret but the uh, he proved that by actually sending those knives and get the tested testing done I when I was there when we were there he was showing us yeah this like it was fun this is how, how it came out. Like I was like, Rockwell 64 and VS1. I thought they gets only like say 62 one two. Hmm. Like it's all thought it's almost like a regular VG10 type of hardness. Like no no no. This is how yeah, how I like that is cool. <laughs> <laughs> that is cool. So we uh will be um getting the new lines with that. But yeah, just as I was saying, the uh, his new lines, some of them have very faint lines and intentionally came up with the uh, with his probably technique of sharpening and things like that. Uh, moving on, James Wang says that he really likes the feedback while sharpening Hanyaki. I especially like when I'm working on a, a Hamon line. Mm -hmm section i can really feel the hardness difference mm. and uh yeah and that's, blank blank agrees that's yeah that's 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 crazy right the uh how and it's such such i personally don't think it's the uh maybe over engineered for <laughs> the purpose that the uh especially for the single bevel knives to retain that the straightness but it's a it's a showcasing the skill Hmm. and dedication of the blacksmith as well as the sharpener. Well, and Blank Blank just said that they made their first Hanyaki blade. So oh. uh, obviously they're doing pretty well. Uh, and Barbacoa Brothers ask, uh, any idea who does the forging for Yoshihiro knives? I've had two AS that were nice quality. The uh, If... If it's Kurochi and the, if it's black and a hammer, 
It's the uh, machine forged by the Hokiyama. It's that by Shihiro. Hmm. Sorry, I know too much stuff. <laughs> But they're good quality though. That don't don't get me wrong. It's it's great quality. Hokiyama is this uh, manufacturer in the um, Tosa, and they combine great method of methodology of the uh, many machinery forging as well as the uh, lots of hand forging or hand sharpening as well. Um, and their roller forging technique is great as well. So it's it's. A lot of people think the um, like machine forged knives are like machine does do this, <laughs> you know, like punch. It's it's anything. It's nothing like it. Nothing like that people would imagine. We will. We are actually working on uh, creating this content of how those knives are actually made, and it's passed down so many people's hand. It's like, and it, also their machines, some of the, the grinding machines are old, so they, they have to be adjusted every time with the thickness and stuff. It relies on the expertise of a lot of people. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. A machinist, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, those machinists needs to know about the, how the knife should be and everything. So it's the, it's, 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 it's fascinating. Okay, one last call for questions. I think we're almost ready to wrap up. The questions seem to have slowed down a bit. How's the Mizu looking? That's that's good. I'm I'm just like enjoying using the little <laughs> different stones and oh yeah. Okay, well it seems that we're good. So thanks everybody well, for thank joining you. us. Well, the is it no yesterday was Fourth of July. Hopefully, mm -hmm. hope everyone had a good long weekend for Can Canada for the the Canada Day long oh. and the uh, for the states it's the uh, Independence Day. Mm -hmm. All right. All righty.